get ready for your unofficial dental hygiene podcast. These are the tales of two hygienists, one East Coast RDH and one West Coast guy genist. Listen as they tackle the profession of dental hygiene with humor and enthusiasm. Now, please join Michelle Strange and Andrew Johnston as they tell you a tale of two hygienists. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to a bonus episode of A Tale of Two Hygienist podcast. My name is Andrew. And my name is Michelle. So for those new to the podcast, each week Michelle and I bring on an amazing guest from the dental world who fills our nerd brains with new insight or affirms our clinical abilities. And we are so grateful for the time and effort these guests put into making us better. We also wanted to acknowledge that this episode is powered by Crest Oral-B. And this episode wouldn't be possible without them. And we know you guys are going to really enjoy this episode. Hey, Michelle. Yeah. It's time for the interview. Oh, but I had something else to say. We need to let the experts talk now. Fine. So for this interview, we have Sherry Lukes. You actually heard her on the podcast before. I believe we talked about pathology, if I can remember correctly. And we are very excited to have you back on. And we're going to be talking about stannous fluoride and kind of, we'll probably digress a little bit here or there, but um, we're excited to learn from you today. Thank you and welcome. Well, thank you for having me again. Always, always a pleasure. So let's uh, jump into it. So um, what is your specific reason or interest in stannous fluoride? Well, I have to digress a bit here. My Yeah, my specialty is oral pathology. So uh, I taught that for oh, 25 years at SIU in Carbondale, Illinois, go Salukis. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then I... Uh, and so after I retired from academia, I started, um, I taught, uh, I, since I taught oral path, I uh, developed CE courses. And so, um, and then also since I retired, I've started doing some writing. And so I was approached about uh, doing some research and writing about stannous fluoride. And it actually goes along with my pathology courses well, because when I talk about lesions, because stannous fluoride is the bomb. <laughs> All right. It is it is an awesome uh, substance, and so I uh, started doing more research on Stannis to write this paper. I was intrigued by all of the capabilities of Stannis as I reviewed it, because you know we tend to think of Stannis fluoride just for caries prevention, and it does so much more. And then you know I realized, wow, anti- the antimicrobial activity really applies to my oral pathology courses. Because when I talk about lesions, and then I talk about, okay, so how can we help these patients? I like to add that, you know, hygienists really, I feel like, should be recommending an antimicrobial toothpaste. uh, Because, you know, we always think in terms of decay, but really, if a patient has a lesion, you don't want that lesion to become secondarily infected. So an antimicrobial toothpaste is the best toothpaste to prescribe for the lesion as well as for, you know, decay prevention and, you know, gingivitis and all that stuff too. What were some of the original uh, use or products? Um, because we've, we've seen stannous fluoride for how many years now? Oh, for what? Over 50. Well, over 50. And was that one of the original fluorides in toothpaste? Yes, mm-hmm. it was. And yeah, it's but, really developed yeah. since then. Oh, absolutely. The problem was being able to uh, maintain a stabilized formulation because it doesn't stay stable. And so that's where most of the research was to develop ways that the stannous molecule, and and I'm not an expert on this, but uh, for the stannous molecule to remain stable, uh, in you know solution so that it could be used so that um, it could be utilized um, by the body as it mixes with the saliva so on and so forth to prevent decay and then they realize over the years how much more it actually does. Would it be safe to say for those that don't really understand stable that it's like it would either bind to other ingredients or it would no longer be 
active before it actually reached right. the patient? Yes, it couldn't, it couldn't be usable, yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. I think what a lot of people don't realize is that when we look at all the different fluorides, they are not all created equal. And stannous fluoride is, of course, anti-caries, you know, we know that. But then uh, what we've learned over the years is how it's um, anti-plaque and anti-gingivitis because it's both bacteriostatic as well as bacteriocidal, uh, which is really, you know, important. It not only inhibits the growth of bacteria, but it also kills it. But it's important that it does both in the whole gingivitis reduction aspect. Can we review static versus cytal? Um, I know we have students that probably have learned that to a point, but I did realize that we do have some hygienists who have maybe left the industry for a moment to be a mama or just because why not? Mm -hmm. And uh, they love these as a review. (laughs) So there's actually three types of bacterial actions that you know, that occur. And so the first is cytal action. So first of all, we know that for decay prevention, it inhibits, it's active in the sugar transport and the utilization mechanisms within the cell. So not only does it inhibit the passage of sugar through the cell wall, it also inhibits the use of that sugar in, inter- in the energy processes. Okay. So... So it slows both the replication of the bacteria, which, which leads to plaque growth, you know, in inhibition, and then a reduction in the metabolites, acids, et cetera, that are produced in, you know, the dental plaque. The cytal action of status fluoride is instrumental in the inhibition of both um, protein and carbohydrate metabolism. Okay. So that's a little down and dirty. <laughs> on the use of, Thank you. Uh, <laughs> and, and and it's and and it works in both super and subgingival plaque. And another big thing about and I feel like I'm all over the place here, but another thing is the the substantivity of stannous mm. fluoride. Um, it stay it gives you protection for a long amount of time. So it's stays in the gingival fluids and in and, and the saliva for like up to 12 hours. And we hear that term a lot with chlorhexidine, substantivity. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then in terms of gingivitis, you know, the new research is really cool because it actually shows Santa's fluoride, they have found it actually binds to the bacterial endotoxins okay. that are produced um, by by the gingival plaque uh, and prevents their interaction with these gingival tissue receptors, these toll like receptors we have in our in our gingival tissues uh, that are you know associated uh, with you know inflammation. And so what that boils down to is that it um, it actually blocks part of the inflammatory you know response. Which is pretty cool. That is pretty um, cool. Just did a paper on this that was um, published um, in um, oh, in RDH as as a CE, and so you know the conclusion, the key conclusions from a lot of the stannic plaque toxicity studies they they did was first of all it binds to the toxins, so the lipopolysaccharides, and then. It actually blocks these endotoxins' reactivity with these toll-like receptors on the, you know, on the cells, and then it um, essentially blunts the inflammatory process to, um, you know, reduce and prevent gingivitis, which is really cool that it actually interferes in part of that, you know, inflammatory um, response. Which is so important now because we know that the host, you have some people that are swimming in plaque and still don't have a lot of inflammation. For sure. Um, and so, um, and so that was very, that was really important, you know, research. Sherry, I would say even the opposite is true sometimes, you know, from a clinical standpoint that mm-hmm. they're not always swimming in plaque, but they have just a ton of inflammation too. And so when you're looking exactly. down at that, why the causative factors of some of these 
these really inflamed patients, I think this is a good starting point maybe for some of those conversations to be had in the clinic. Yes. Yes. It's not all about the quantity Mm -hmm. of plaque. Quality. Quality of plaque. Yes. Yeah, exactly. What they found in in the studies was that the benefits of of Santa's fluoride were seen in both disease sites as well as sites that weren't yet showing signs of disease because of how it was blocking this inflammatory response. Because you have some patients who have very little plaque but still have a lot of you know inflammation. So that's all about the host response. And what does it mean so. for a lesion to become secondarily infected? Yeah, so when you have an... Yeah, here's what I really... Yeah, this is my first love, my true love, is talking about <laughs> lesions, right? And um, <laughs> so say you have an aphthous ulcer... Those are open lesions, and so, yeah, you don't want those, you know, the bacteria in our mouth then to make that, because, le- you know, an aphthous ulcer is an immune response of the body, but then when that ulcer is present in the mouth and exposed to all the bacteria in our, our mouth, it can become secondarily, you know, infected and become even more painful. Meaning like thing. if there was or, a lesion from a pathogen, it could have a fungal infection as a secondary infection. Would that be correct? Yeah, like, like an aphthous ulcer that is an immune mediated. Yeah, so then it can become secondarily infected with, yeah, perhaps a bacteria. Okay. Or, or a fungus, sure, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, or like you have a, a, you know, a biopsy in mm. the you know, oral cavity and... Um, you don't want that area to become secondarily infected with I got you. Okay. The bacteria in the mouth. So an mm-hmm. antibacterial toothpaste. Uh, I was definitely really more important. familiar with primary versus secondary prevention. I really haven't used the secondary infection in a while. So thank you oh, for yeah, refreshing. Yeah. And then another benefit of Santa's fluoride that we've um, realized in the past few years as well is its effect on, you know, erosion. Uh, I did that TED Talk at Under One Roof about, um, you know, erosion, you know, dental erosion. And um, when I was researching that, I, I wasn't very up on, you know, erosion. And at number one, it's becoming, a, it's becoming much, much more prevalent. And... Um, and then so when I started looking at the research <clears throat> and it talks about the, the best modalities for treatment is talked about stannous fluoride being superior to the other types of fluorides for protecting the teeth against the you know the process of erosion. Uh, it actually deposits a protective barrier layer onto the enamel, the enamel surface. It it also like chemically interacts with the natural pellicle. Okay. Um, and provides like enhanced resistance to the pellicle itself, and then and then also that barrier layer. The more you use stannous fluoride, the barrier layer actually increases and then is retained on the tooth for you know for an extended period of time. Yeah. And is that which, with a chemical erosion or um, of like a physical mechanical? Erosion. Well, home. actually, yeah, that's another thing I learned in my research about erosion that, um, you know, it, it's, well, it's defined as a loss of hard dental tissue not caused by, by bacteria. So, you know, mm-hmm. when I used to teach physical and chemical injuries of teeth in my oral path class, you know, attrition, abrasion, erosion, I taught attrition, loss of tooth structure from mechanical action, tooth to tooth, and then abrasion, or excuse me, um, Abrasion loss from mechanical action, uh, so physical frictions mm-hmm. such as improper toothbrushing, and then erosion loss of tooth structure from chemical causes. But actually, erosion is a combination, and so mm-hmm. it's really better known as erosive tooth wear because uh, it is a primarily um, a chemical process, but it's actually a combination of a chemical and a mechanical process. Uh, the, so the two processes occurring over over a period of time, um, and it's not like and, and it's um, up and down through your lifetime. It doesn't happen, you know, overnight. 
Um, so, um, so then what you start seeing are these cusp, uh, cupping of the cusps of teeth, flattening of the occlusal surfaces. Um, and I've always no, attributed different. that to clinching. Yes, and that can, and that certainly, um, certainly uh, contributes. Yeah. So, so you have a person who may may be clenched mm-hmm. for a period a period in their life, a period that were that was especially stressful, or you know, um, whatever. Or they just tend to clench in general, and then yeah. maybe there was a point in their life where they were drinking a lot of acidic beverages. And so it's, you know, it's really multi It's a combination, yeah. Yeah, just like like decay. You know, decay isn't just about sugar, just about oral hygiene, just about fluoride or lack thereof. You know, it's a, it's a, com- you know, it's a combination of things, and erosive tooth wear is the same way. So acid, yeah, is the main cause, both extrinsic and, you know, intrinsic, because people with GERD or, or bulimia, those kind of people. Uh, but there are lots of contributing risk factors. You know, people who have a reduced saliva, you know, mm-hmm. hyposalivation, because, you know, saliva is just an awesome bodily fluid. Um, and we know that not, nothing happens on the tooth until it happens in the saliva. So, you know, because it has a, that's the source of the acquired pellicle that helps protect the tooth against the acid erosion, this buffering capacity and all that stuff. So then people who need help with this really need to use stannous fluoride. And it helps with dental hypersensitivity? What we know about hypersensitivity is some things just are on the surface, but what they found with stannous fluoride is that actually occludes some of those dental tubules, you know, those microscopic tubules Mm -hmm. that run to the nerve. So it actually occludes, you know, those tubules to provide the, the protection against you know, sensitivity. So yeah, so <laughs> when I say stannous fluoride is the bomb, I really mean it because of all the different things that, you know, that it does. And then also because I'm a nerd, acad- you know, academician, uh, a research nerd, there is so much research behind, you know, stannous fluoride. And as you can see, everybody's kind of getting on the bandwagon, right? Mm. Because in the product line, of course, the pioneers in stannous fluoride was um, Procter & Gamble, uh, who makes Crest and, and all the, the different Crest products. And then, uh, so for a long time in my courses, I would say, okay, as far as antimicrobial paste, you really should use an antimicrobial paste. And I'd say this one, stannous fluoride, when I talked about Crest, uh, Crest Pro Health, and then Crest, the new one, Crest Gum Um, detoxify. And then I would point to Colgate and say, uh, this one's antimicrobial as well because it has triclosan. But now we know that recently Colgate took this um, triclosan out of their paste Mm -hmm. and put in, and put in stannous fluoride. And then let's see, there's another paste, I think that has stannous fluoride, Paradontex, I think. By GSK, yeah. But now, I'll have to say, I haven't looked at any of their, you know, research, Colgate's or GSK's. I haven't looked at their research as far as, you know, their formulation and so on and so forth. Because it does have to be a specific formulation for it to do all the things that, you know, that it does on the chemical level. And, you know, like I say, I don't, I don't know the specifics of all that, but it does have to be a specific formulation. But so, yeah, so, so it protects against carries. It protects against gingivitis. It's both bacteriostatic as well as bactericidal. Uh, because I think triclosan was only bactericidal. It was just one or the other. I don't remember for sure. Okay. And then it protects against dental hypersensitivity, mm-hmm. the way it occludes, you know, the tubules. Um, and, and there's research on all this. And then um, and then the research now on how it blocks the inflammatory response in gingivitis as well, how it protects against, you know, erosion. So it's the bomb, you know, it does so many different things. Why would we not use it all the time is kind of my thing. You mentioned the studies. So I have a couple of questions mm-hmm. for 
people okay. like me who are not so much goodly at doing the studies, how do you select goodly. a study? <laughs> yeah, goodly. How do you select a study? What What is your personal process about seeing if a study is worth noting? Because I feel like in addition to sans fluoride, many other things that are out there that people tout as being the next biggest thing maybe don't have the research behind it. So how how can we do that? Right. Do they have multiple studies? Do they have multiple studies that sh- that you know that um, support their claim? Okay. Have there been systematic reviews on all these studies? Do they have good methodology? Um, and so. I always look for a systematic review, a meta-analysis, because those are the highest level of, you know, research. And so what, they, what that does is they take all the research on something and they look at it and say, okay, I'm, we're going to throw out this study because the methodology was poor. We're going to throw out this study because it was kind of comparing apples to oranges. And then, um, and, and then we're going to look at just the ones that have sound methodology, so on and so forth. And then those uh, findings are combined to say, yes, this does indeed do what it, what it says it's you know, supposed to mm-hmm. based on this good research. Because let's face it, we have, you know, we have studies that there's maybe one study out there that says fluoride causes thyroid cancer, right? So then that's where the anti, anti-fluoridationists anti come and they say, oh, look, we have this one study that said, well, you can't base anything on one study. You have to have multiple studies with good methodology, all the variables controlled. And I think sometimes that's where we get in trouble because, you know, sometimes we don't know how to look at, at research very well and somebody will you know, tout a study and say, oh, this shows this, that, or the other. And then I'm like, okay, then show me more than one study on that. I, love mm-hmm. that. I mean, if you only have one, I mean, you know, that's nothing. You know, you have to have multiple studies and then being able to combine those into a systematic review, you know, meta-analysis. That's what I, I would even say length for. of and the study as well, because sometimes you'll see these with exactly. like three weeks at a time and they have exactly. the most amazing... That's where your methodology, yeah, that's yeah. where your methodology comes in. Or they do it on 10 people. <laughs> right, their <laughs> sample know? size is, yeah, yeah sample so size. tiny. Now, granted, sometimes you can't have a large sample size, depending on what you know you're, what what you're looking at. But and I don't, I mean, I don't claim to be an expert on the research process that much either. But with with my master's degree, of course, I had to do you know research, and I so I I know how to, and I think most hygienists have. Have plenty of capability to mm-hmm. uh, look 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 at at a study and to be able to tell if it's decent. They know enough about methodology and so on and so forth from you know their training to be able to you know look at a study and decide. Okay, is this good? Is it something I need to delve into more deeply? How many more are there on this topic and all that kind of stuff. So it's really important to take look at the research and not take it for face value with the marketing Absolutely. campaigns are yeah. telling you. Yeah, because everybody says, hey, my product's the best, right? Right. <laughs> I mean, everybody says that. And so my, my reply to that always is, okay, sh- you know, sh- um, show me the evidence. So how many studies do you have? Um, what, were, what were your patient populations? And start asking some of those questions and sometimes and yeah and people can hand you a study you know and sometimes I Mm want to go okay is this it you uh you mentioned a couple of times how firmly you believe in the paste for all different reasons have they also done stabilized stannous fluoride with rinses that have proven equally effective or not quite yet yeah I'm not as well versed on rinses, the active ingredient. So yes, there is fluoride in the rinses, but there's also CPC in rinses. That's well, there are several things in rinses that are good for antibacterial activity. Um, there's you know chlorine dioxide uh, that's in a product, and it works differently 
and again, I'm not a chemist. I don't know all of that, but um, but uh, CPC is an active ingredient that's good in um, some of of the rinse. Well, and there's you know there's several things that are antibacterial. We know chlorhexidine, and they all work. They all work a little differently. That was um, I'm looking for. That was in. I outlined those in the article I did that CE I did for RDH. So the antimicrobial action, so we, you know, we had triclosan and it was, you know, like it was a copolymer. It has lesser antimicrobial benefit than chlorhexidine, but, you know, chlorhexidine stains, it has a nasty taste, you know, um, so on and so forth. And then, of course, I talked about stannis as well. And what we still hear about stannis is, you know, the staining. Mm -hmm. And so my comment to that always is, well, first of all, you have to have plaque to stain. So we have to help our patients become as plaque-free as possible. And then they have placed substances in the paste to eliminate the staining. Like in the most recent product by uh, by Crest is zinc citrate. So anyway, so, uh, you know, when people start bashing stannous fluoride because of the staining, I just want to, uh, <laughs> you know, let's help people keep stay as plaque-free as possible. And then... But they're seeing uh, it much let- less now, right? Yeah, exactly. With some products more than others um, is is what I'm still hearing in my courses because they still, especially hygienists with hair the color of mine when I don't cover up that gray, um, they still say uh, things like, "Uh, nope, I still see staining with Stannis. Uh, So, you know, I don't know. Part of me is confused by that. Now, I do hear that with some of the rinses, mm-hmm. they're, they're still seeing more staining. Rinses versus that the, have stannous versus in the them paste. versus a t- paste, yeah. So in mouth rinses, one of the highly substantive bioavailable substance is, you know, uh, CPC, acetylpyridinium chloride. Is yeah, that how I you say it? Sh- something. I struggle with that one all the time. Yeah. That's why people abbreviate yeah. to CPC. Just CPC. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, right. Exactly. So it's a broad spectrum of antimicrobial. Um, it promotes long-lasting bacteriostatic and bacteri- bacteriocidal properties. And some people want that, they want a mouth rinse too. They don't want just the paste. Mm -hmm. So let me see. It works primarily via lysis of the organism cell walls, disruption of cell metabolism, and inhibition of cell growth. It also has demonstrated plaque inhibiting and uh, gingival health benefits. And a lot of them are alcohol-free because a lot of people don't like the burning sensation of the rinses that have alcohol in them. So CPC is mainly in uh, mouth rinses. So with Mm. our patients, if we can go back to to your oral path background, and our patients with lichen, uh, lichen planus or pemphigoid, uh, uh-huh, maybe uh-huh. Um, short, Shordrens. I say that wrong, everything. Sjogren's syndrome, yeah. Sjogren's. In fact, that's mm-hmm. the Swedish word, and the Swedes don't say it that way, and that's why it always screws me up. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, yes. I want to know how they say it. I, well, don't ask me, because I, every time they try to tell me, I get the two words now like mixed up. <laughs> like, it messes me up every time. <laughs> so people with even just decreased salivary flow, I mean, mm-hmm. is this a product that they can be using? Will it dry anything out? Will it create any kind of... Um, Irritation or infl- or in, not infl- inflammation, but just irritation, I guess. You mean stannous fluoride? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, everybody's different, mm-hmm. so you never say mm-hmm. never, ne- never say all, uh, always. But to my knowledge, it doesn't have properties that enhance the pain in some of those individuals with, you know, like planus or uh, benign mucous membrane, pemphigoid, all of those. But now, again, different people are different. And so uh, some people have may have more accented, be stimulated differently. Pain a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It's going to reduce the antimicrobial activity 
I would think that that would help overall. Well, and but does it make so it that in, was a in, thing. I, if I could just kind of go back to my um, clinical experience with lichen planus, my patients uh-huh. who would always have that breakout. And it was always tender for them to clean their teeth because their gums felt yes. like they were being ripped a- away. Exactly. When I could have them control um, the plaque on a routine basis, so maybe dropping them down to an extra soft bristle, seeing them yep. more frequently in their outbreak break stage. Mm-hmm. Um, from an anecdotal experience, I saw them recover a lot faster. And of exactly. course, I couldn't ever find that at the time in the science to support that, you know, when we have a lot of plaque buildup on those um, immune compromised patients and we have that acidic environment, that it just mm-hmm. kind of exacerbates everything. I mean, would you exactly. you're agreeing with them? Yeah, absolutely. And so anytime you can reduce the bacterial load in the mouth, you're going to have better results because, again, you don't have bacteria secondarily affecting the you know, immune response that's going on you know, in the mouth. Because like in Plantis, Sjogren's, all those are considered immune. Well, Sjogren's is totally different than, you know, than like in Plantis, but um, they are autoimmune conditions. Then you don't want any extra bacteria exacerbating what's already going on at, at the tissue level. So just encouraging, disrupting the biofilm, routine cleaning at home with whatever you can do that will yeah. help. Yeah, absolutely. Is a good That's why it's, it is so important for those patients to give them uh, the tools where they can stay as plaque free as possible. So keep some of those soft t- surgical brushes in the operatory rather than sending patients to the to the pharmacy and mm-hmm. you know I show I show a picture in my presentations of a, of an oral care aisle and I'm like look at that who could find yeah. anything there I did the so same. yeah so I like to suggest that we keep those things in office to dispense to patients you know charge them for it but certainly um you know, give them the tools they need to stay as plaque free, you know, uh, as possible. Sherry, do you have any of the um, papers that we could read on the the podcast for a story time with Michelle at the end of this? Yeah. Mm-hmm. That would be great. Yeah. That way we can really yeah. um, give people that information. And if they want, if they're audio listeners, then they can keep on listening. If not, then we'll give yeah. them a link to some of these papers that you wrote. And if you have any favorite research studies, we would love to link to the abstracts oh, so yeah, that they yeah, can yeah. maybe go and find those as well. Um, yeah, Andrew has, has his fans on. that aren't as nerdy as I am, but then there's some that are as nerdy <laughs> as I am. And you are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The one I just wrote was uh, titled Pathways to Gingivitis Control with Stabilized Stannous Fluoride, a novel discovery. And so that's the one that talks about how they have, you know, identified the way it blocks part of the inflammatory response uh, mm. with toll like receptors. Um, and then there's there's just lots of research on the benefits of stannis with, you know, with gingivitis. And then, of course, we know that tons of research on the anti-caries uh, benefits. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, erosion. Like, I looked at a lot of research on benefits of stannis uh, for, you know, erosion as well. So I guess, you know, stannis fluoride probably has been researched as much or more than any fluoride out there. And so I, I just I, I just feel like it doesn't get its due. It doesn't get the the love that it mm-hmm. should. I you know? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I, well but, it's been and, around a long time and sometimes we forget about the basics and the tried and true, right? We get so we get yeah, a little fancy so. for our own britches <laughs> and marketing of other products definitely mm-hmm. they get us and mm-hmm. I think you're getting back to what 
worked and what's been around, around a long time, what has a lot of research. So we appreciate yeah. you though, for coming on and doing all of this and having this conversation with us and last minute, no less. So yeah. we <laughs> appreciate you so much for that. Well, well you are most welcome. You're, you, you always have that, that very calming voice. I love you. Well, both of you do, I think. You oh, I'm pitchy and super exaggerated about everything. So yeah. it's okay. Oh. You can tell Andrew that. <laughs> So would you Sounds like good. to give out any of your contact information or anywhere you might be speaking um, soon? Oh, sure. Yeah. I, um, so you can look at my website, www.sherrylukes.com. I, all my courses are listed there. I am going to be doing a course on HPV at Under One Roof, you know, this summer in Grapevine, Texas, outside of Dallas. Mm-hmm. Uh, doing a meeting in Novi, Michigan next month and um, just finished a busy winter. Usually the winter is slow, but um, I was very busy this winter and then have several coming up this fall. So, and they're all listed on my website as well. Awesome. Uh, so, and yeah, smlukes at siu.edu is my email. And yeah, I'd be, I would love to do someone's meeting. Because I can talk about oral pathology all day and into the night. <laughs> Love it. Well, I'm sure we could all use a refresher on that. So if you haven't been to one of Sherry's courses, you should definitely do that. If you have any questions about anything that um, maybe you want to find out, well, we're going to do some links, but maybe you want to find out some more information that we haven't linked to, you're welcome to contact her. But definitely go to one of the courses. It's always fun. Thank you. You're thanks. welcome. You're welcome. And thank you again for coming back on. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Sherry. Oh, you're so welcome. You're welcome, guys. Take care. It's about that time. Grab your blanket and a glass of wine. It's story time with Michelle. So you guys haven't heard story time with Michelle in a moment, but it's back. Don't worry. And Andrew's also doing his own. Yay, it's with Yay. me. Everyone, yay, yay. Maybe you'll do a better job at reading them than I, I do think, usually. No, it, I, think our, I think our people know that I do not read well. I mean, I'm, <laughs> a, I'm a competent reader. It's just on a computer screen. It just, it's weird saying it out loud into a microphone and all sorts of things. Anyways, I'll quit talking about it so maybe I don't suck myself out. Um, there you go. Who's going to go first, Michelle? Mm, so we're talking Stannis fluoride. I have a really cool one. From 2018, this is from the Advances in Dental Research. Um, It's coming from like your International Association for Dental Research and your American Association for Dental Research. And it is titled, and it's coming from uh, January 2018, Stannis Fluoride Effects on Gene Expression of Strep Mutans and Actinomyces Viscosis. Hopefully I say that correctly. The anti-caries effects of topical fluorides are derived from multiple mechanisms, including inhibitory effects on plaque acid production. Literature reports have long suggested that some fluorides appear more effective than others with respect to retarding acid production from sugar metabolism, and Stannis fluoride has been reported to demonstrate superior activity. A number of studies have examined specific mechanisms for Stannis fluoride unique anti-glycolysis effects. Stannous fluoride has been shown in in inhibiting the growth uh, and metabolic functions of a wide range of microorganisms. In this context, a number of studies showed that stannous fluoride was absorbed, adsorbed, by the way, adsorbed readily onto bacterial cell walls and produced a variety of effects, including the reduction of bacterial adhesion and cohesion. Opperman et al. 1980 showed that stannous fluoride was bound to plaque bacteria and the cysteine, cysteine washing could reverse effects, suggesting that binding of the thiol groups on dental plaque bacteria may be involved in the antimicrobial activity of the molecule. Lipotychoic acid, Lord help me, was also identified as a surface site for stannous ion adsorption on gram-positive cocci. Stannous fluoride has been shown to accumulate intracellularly, reported that stannous fluoride specifically impairs selenium metabolism, and inhibition of selenium metabolism led to decrease of the adenosine triphosphate, so the ATP synthesis uh, for this organism. In a particularly interesting set of studies, 
from 1978 compared activity of stannous fluoride and ionic fluorides on mutant streptococci and the leuconostoc mesenteroids. The, their studies suggested that stannous fluoride provide unique efficacy in inhibition of bacterial glycolysis, affecting not only enolase, the role of fluoride, but also the phosphophenoenopyruvate carbohydrate phosphotransferase, and the latter enzyme facilitating translocation of glucose across the bacteria cell membrane. So moving on before I shoot myself with all of these words, um, we're going to go to the discussion. Stannous fluoride was the first ingredient demonstrated to be clinically effective in preventing uh, or the prevention of caries when added to toothpaste in the 1950s. Like other fluorides, stannous fluoride provides the benefits of remineralization and protection against demineralization. However, it is unique from other fluorides because it has an antimicrobial property. Ramji and colleagues demonstrated the ability of a 0.454% stannous fluoride formulation to reduce acidogenicity using in vitro biofilms in the plaque glycolysis and regrowth model. Furthermore, stannous fluoride has been shown to reduce the amount of total acid from plaque glycolysis by over 50% related uh, relative to sodium fluoride. To deliver the antimicrobial benefits, stannous fluoride must be bioavailable, requiring formulation and the stabilization of adenovirus. Many early formulations did not meet these criteria and therefore did not deliver maximum efficacy. In addition, they have had aesthetic negatives. In recent years, with continued research in the field, stannous fluoride has experienced a renaissance. With its antimicrobial properties fashioned into denifrices, providing multiple therapeutic as well as aesthetic benefits. Adenifrous com compromising of 0.454% stannous fluoride, or 1,100 parts per million fluoride ion, was clinically shown to produce statistically significant caries reduction relative to a 0.243 sodium fluoride denifrous, or 1,100 parts per million fluoride ion, in a two-year clinical study. The, the clinical observation was consistent with historical rat carry studies that reported that stannous fluoride treatment in water provides significant reductions in cavities compared to sodium fluoride at equal levels of fluoride ion. One hypothesis advanced for this efficacy may be effects of stannous fluoride on acid formation by dental plaque in addition to its other anti-caries mechanisms. The study expands our understanding of the pathways of suppression of plaque acidogenesis genicity for stannous fluoride. Among all oral bacteria, S. mutans is an important organism implicated in dental caries worldwide and is considered the most cariogenic of all oral streptococci. The genome of S. mutans UA159 has been sequenced completely and is composed of 2,030,936 base pairs. It contains 1,963 open reading frames and 63% of which have been assigned putative functions. Um, a viscosis um, has also reported a genome information. In this study, the effects of sodium and stannous fluorides were compared for effects of gene expression in these two karyogenic strains. With respect to ionic fluoride, in vitro enzymatic Activity tests previously indicated that fluoride inhibits enolase by binding directly to the protein of the enzyme in the presence of phosphate. In our study, upon 10 minutes of uh, sodium tre uh, fluoride treatment, the mutan genes expressed was in a inhibited significantly. This indicates that besides the fluoride enzyme interaction, fluoride also inhibits gene expression in the tagatose pathway. This study also confirmed observations of Kanipka and colleagues by showing that stannous or sodium fluoride significantly inhibited the genes involved in mannose, cellobios, fructose, sugar, and specific components of the PTS compared to the non-fluoride negative control. Multiple sugars are transported into bacteria cell via the specific PTS. We observed that the several genes involved in PTS specific for transport of glucose, lactose, mannose, sorbose, 
um, cellobios and fructose were inhibited significantly with stannous fluoride. One of the most interesting findings of this study was the strong differential inhib- inhibition of gala galactose me- metabolic pathways by stannous fluoride. Galactose metabolic pathways primarily use lactose. Lactose abundant in milk and other dairy products is considered to play an important role in the oral microbial ecology due to its use in the human diet. So bovine milk has mixed association with dental caries since in addition to lactose, a potentially cariogenic sugar, milk has protective factors such as casein and gram positive bacteria, lactose is internalized by the PEP-dependent PTS, yielding lactose 6-phosphate. Um, in contrast to S-mutans, A. viscosis C505 presented a less sensitive to 100 parts per million of stannous fluoride. Investiga- investigators have previously demonstrated that fluoride inhibits microbial growth, metabolic activity, and acid production in dental plaque in vitro and in vivo. Both NLAs and PEPPTS were previously identified and identified as metabolic pathways influenced by fluorides. This study measured effects of fluoride and stannous fluoride on gene expression in two organisms with prominent roles in caries development, and they importantly support general observations on the comparative effects of stannous fluoride versus fluoride ions previously in the literature. Uh, For example, Mayhew and Brown previously compared the effects of sodium uh, stannous and SNCL2, which I don't know that one, on the growth of cariogenic strain of S-mutans. Stannous sub Fluoride suppressed a bacterial growth of a fluoride negative, F negative uh, concentration of 75 parts per million, whereas it required 300 parts per million in sodium fluoride to achieve a similar suppression of bacterial growth. Our microlay supports uh, results support that stannous fluoride uniquely suppresses bacterial sugar met- metabolism in two important bacterial strains associated with caries. The end. Fantastic. Yeah, whatever. Wow. Now I have to edit this. Continue part on, of, my friend. Because of your sassy McSasserson mood. Ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Just kidding. Jesus. I'm not going to do that voice. <laughs> 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 that would make it funny, though. <coughs> What's that? That would be funny, though, but I love that you it can't even do it without coughing. I know. It was too much. Okay. So for my story time with Andrew, um, this is coming from from Sherry's uh, dentalcare.com course that she gave. Now, we don't want to give out too much of it because we want you to go to dentalcare.com and do it yourself. But I'm gonna, I want to talk a little bit about the inflammation discussion that we had earlier. So this part is inflammation and a new pathway to gingivitis control. So she has it labeled Inflammation, the big picture. Before discussion of the control of gingivitis, it is necessary to first grasp how inflammation occurs and its relevance to disease in the periodontium. The word inflammation brings to mind imagery of angry looking tissue underlying and precipitating that surface manifestation lies a complex reactionary microcellular process that serves as a biologic defense operation to attack pathogenic microorganisms and other injurious and irritating stimuli within body systems an external threat triggers the release of inflammatory mediators to attenuate or destroy it and the process causes characteristic signs of acute inflammation for example heat edema or erythema exudate and pain the initial step in the inflammatory process involves threat recognition Cells in the bodily tissues functioning as lookouts scan for probable irritants, injurious agents, and detect that the invaders have unique patterns that differ from the host. This propels the recruitment phase of inflammation where host inflammatory mediators like cytokines are mobilized and bring about an immune response through vascular and cellular permeability effects. While inflammation has benefit as a protective and micro and restorative healing mechanism in acute local reactions, when unresolved, inflammation can become chronic, 
pro-inflammatory cytokines are implicated in the development of pathways of serious systemic health conditions, including type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and adverse pregnancy outcomes. These and other chronic inflammations, including oral health-related, may result in irreversible damage unless there is intervention. The next section is how gingival inflammation develops. Supragingival plaque is initially colonized primarily by gram-positive aerobic bacteria. If plaque deposits are left undisturbed and allowed to mature, the subgingival microbiota composition shifts to predominantly gram-negative anaerobic bacteria and becomes more virulent. Uh, examples of frequency found subgingival plaque bacterial species include... Yep, yeah, not going to do that one. There's a bunch of them, though. <sighs> After watching Michelle struggle, I decided not to do that. What specifically does the corresponding inflammatory process look like in the gingival tissues? In the earliest stages, where plaque and calculus are serving as an irritant in the sulcus, only histological tissue changes can be seen. In homeostasis, if homeostasis is not restored by modulation or removal of the irritant, this lesion will likely become pathogenic and lead to visible local vasodilation, edema, and increased gingival curricular fluid. A well-orchestrated intracellular signaling pathway governs the pathogen host tissue interface. Toll-like receptors, TLR, in the periodontium, predominantly TLR4 and TLR2, reside on the cell walls in the periodontal ligament fibroblasts, the gingival fibroblasts, the epithelia, the endothelia, and also in the cells of the individual's immune system, including macrophages and neutrophils. During the recognition phase, TLRs, scan for bacterial pathogens like those residing in the biofilm of plaque and then mount a complex defense reaction if provoked. A closer look at the inflammatory defense reaction shows that TLR bind and interact with plaque bacterial endotoxins such as lipopolysaccharides and lipotechoic acid, LTA. This interaction introduces, induces a series of events which includes the production of inflammatory generating cytokines, and other effector mo molecules. Toxic metabolites produced by the invading pathogens further provoke and increase the TLR response can be found and can result in reduced tissue repair, more inflammation, and greater permeability of the tissue. Should the early lesion progress to an established lesion with the proliferation of plasma cells, lymphocytes and macrophages moderate severe gingivitis will be apparent with clearly visible gingival contour, color, and bleeding abnormalities. In susceptible patients and without intervention and a return to, the, to homeostasis, there is likely a transition to an advanced lesion. Chronic inflammation results, which may lead to extracellular matrix tissue destruction and possible bone loss associated with periodontitis. And then this section is the stannous fluoride as a plaque toxicity modulator. If mechanical plaque removal is not universally well practiced and certain patients, even with decent oral hygiene, react in an amplified fashion to plaque bacteria due to host susceptibility factors, what effective solutions exist for the, for the prevention and control of gingivitis? Adjunctive commercially available chemotherapeutics like bioavailable stannous fluoride dentifrice that can impact plaque toxicity irrespective of plaque quantity are an intelligent strategy in light of nearly ubiquitous usage of toothbrushing as the main oral hygiene practice. Why focus on this particular antimicrobial? There are several, fact, several reasons why stannous fluoride has a distinct profile among oral chemotherapeutic options. Of the three fluorides most commonly incorporated in commercial toothpaste today, Stannous fluoride is the sole anti-caries agent that is also an antimicrobial agent, providing clinically proven benefits against the plaque, gingivitis, and breath malodor. The bacteriostatic bactericidal effects of stannous fluoride are sustained beyond the brushing window due to its notab notable substantivity, which we talked about earlier in the episode. Uh, stannous fluoride is also the only common fluoride source to protect against both enamel erosion and dental hypersensitivity. Bioavailable stannous fluoride's gingival health properties are well-established and recognized to be associated with its anti-plaque effects 
such as inhibiting and reducing plaque bacteria's adhesion and growth, along with the inhibition of acid production and other metabolic toxins. However, research has shown that the quantity of plaque bacteria does not firmly correlate with gingival inflammation. To explore if the other factors beyond metabolic actions might be at play and whether stannous fluoride could directly interact with bacterial endotoxins to affect pathogenicity, a series of laboratory and clinical investigations employing novel methodologies were conducted to evaluate the potential plaque endotoxin binding to oral care cationic antimicrobials like stannous fluoride. This research generated the new findings revealing in the addition, additional means by which bioavailable stannous fluoride apparently acts to control plaque while preventing and reducing gingivitis. Stannous fluoride disrupts the gingival inflammation process by reducing plaque toxicity. A summary of the students' findings on this effect showed that before the host TLRs in the gingival sulcus can mount the inflammatory response that would be expected when encountering plaque bacteria endotoxins, stannous fluorides present in the mouth from toothbrushing intervenes and binds the endotoxins, thus effectively blocking them from affixing with TLRs and undermining the typical cytokine-driven series of events that leads to inflammation and bleeding. With regular exposure to a properly formulated bioavailable, bioavailable stannous fluoride dentifrice, then the customary deleterious effects of plaque endotoxins can be blunted, preventing gingivitis or reducing it to a level consistent with homeostasis and lowering the potential for the advanced periodontal disease. To better visualize how bioavailable fluoride impacts the inflammatory response, consider the example of a traditional alarm clock. Here, the electrical cord connecting the alarm clock to the electrical outlet symbolizes the host TLR. While the, outlo- while the outlet is analogous to plaque LPS endotoxin, in the absence of stannous fluoride, plugging in the cord TLR to the outlet LPS results in a preset alarm function by going off, or in the case of the TLR LPS, the triggering of the inflammatory cascade. However, if a childproof outlet protector covers the electrical outlet and blocks the cord from being plugged in, the clock has no power and the alarm cannot be activated. Similarly, with bioavailable stannous fluoride acting in like fashion to the safety outlet cover, LPS is bound and the gingival inflammation response is thwarted. Controlled in vivo trials are an important means of confirming the validity and application of laboratory testing. Randomized controlled clinical trials with the addition, the additional toxicity measurements have confirmed these effects. Research by Klikowska and colleagues incorporated subgingival plaque sampling in sites up to 4 millimeters in depth in a four-week randomized clinical controlled trial of twice daily unsupervised brushing with 0.454% bioavailable sans fluoride dentifrice, wherein both a low gingival bleeding cohort healthy, and a high bleeding cohort, or diseased, were evaluated. Clinical effectiveness trials of marketed marketed dentifrices do not commonly include subgingival plaque sampling, but its inclusion in this trial provided insight into the depths of penetration of stannous fluoride, its retention, and its ability to reduce subgingival plaque toxicity. At week four, both cohorts saw significant 42% and 53% mean reductions in gingival bleeding. The plaque sampling results in both the healthy and diseased groups provided evidence following the use of stannous fluoride of notably decreased LPS, LTA, dye activity, and TLR activity. Morning wake-up plaque samples uh, via salivary lavage showed significantly suppressed short-change carboxylic acid toxins for both the low and high bleeding groups, as well suggesting robust substantivity. The researchers noted the important implication of this research and a previous complementary trial. The effects of the stannous fluoride to bind with endotoxins and thereby limit TRL4 and TRL2 in initiating the inflammatory cascade manifested both in the diseased, high bleeding sites and also the low bleeding sites with minimal measurable disease, suggesting a preventive as well as a treatment gingivitis strategy. A subsequent trial evaluating stannous fluoride penetration within the sulcus and retention 
in gingival corrector fluid provided further evidence that stannous fluoride can influence the pathogenicity of microflora subgingivally. In this two-week trial of, of subjects with a minimum of 20 bleeding dental pockets up to 4 millimeters in depth and no recent stannous fluoride exposure, GCF samples were analyzed with mass spectro- spectrometry for the presence of tin, a stannous fluoride marker, at both 30 minutes and 12 hours after brushing with a bioavailable stannous fluoride identifiers on day one. The results showed that significant levels of tin compared with baseline were detected in the GCF samples. Higher tin levels were seen at day 14 after two weeks of home dentifrice use, suggesting an, increment, an incremental effect was ongoing with ongoing use. More confirmation of, of bioavailable stannous fluoride's ability to diminish the virulence of subgingival plaque and thus the development of, of gingivitis was demonstrated by recent clinical research evaluating gingival inflammation and bleeding in 99 adult subjects with gingivitis. After eight weeks of at-home 0.454% stannous fluoride dentifrous use, significant reductions in gingivitis and bleeding versus baseline were observed. These clinical observations were consistent with the results of subgingival plaque sampling, where TLR2 uh, uh, assay analysis and HTLR2 reporter gene activity showed significant mean reductions following two months of stannous fluoride brushing. Incorporating stannous fluoride in dentifrice to yield maximum aesthetics and efficacy, including fully bioavailability, mandates precise, well-skilled formulation. In recent years, several technological advances resulting from ongoing scientific innovations and testing have led to the bioavailable stannous fluoride formations, which have, proved, uh, which have provided superior tartar control and whitening effects, along with the therapeutic, therapeutic benefits versus a variety of dentifrice controls in multiple clinical trials. The extensive clinical research program by Procter & Gamble on stannous fluoride dentifrice, which has spanned numerous decades, resulted in a crest dentifrice being the first to be recognized for the seven attributes applicable to toothpaste in the American Dental Association's seal of acceptance program, which, and those criteria are uh, prevent or reduce enamel erosion, prevent caries, prevent and reduce plaque, prevent and reduce gingivitis, reduce tooth sensitivity, reduce bad breath, remove tooth surface stain. And there is plenty more in this course brought to you by one Sherry Lukes on dentalcare.com and it's and I, I think I actually forgot to say the name but the name of the the uh, course is called reexamining the plaque gingivitis connection and the role of stannous fluoride so look it up sweet we hope you enjoyed this episode powered by Crescent Oral B and be sure to check out the show notes and click the link to get your CE credits for this course also you can check out dentalcare.com for more on demand CE courses and to listen to more great episodes from us, you can go to a tale of two hygienists.com. You are welcome to send us emails with feedbacks, and questions, comments at a tale of two hygienist at gmail.com. And you can always find us on any of the social media like Facebook and Instagram. And we welcome all direct messages and sharing of all the episodes. Be sure to stay tuned for more bonus episodes powered each month by Crest Oral B. Anything else, Andrew? I think that's it. Have a good week, everyone. Bye, y'all. Bye.